Hi, my name is Johanna. I make science and gaming videos to avoid doing other things, which is right now it's just I'm just waiting. So for once it it's cool. I'm not, actually not avoiding anything. In today's video, we are going to talk about the Unibomber case. However, this is not a true crime video. So if you're here for gory details and stuff like that, Skip it, there's not going to be any of that. We're not going to talk much about the case, only very superficially. What we are going to talk about is linguistic elements in the case and how language science linguistics was used in the case. So specifically, we're talking about forensic linguistics, which is the act of using linguistics for profiling and, and as evidence in cases, which is really exciting. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So my personal perspective on the case is very focused around um, two presentations I went to. Natalie Schilling and James R. Fitzgerald actually visited my university and spoke about this case. So I'm really, really interested in the case because these two people did such a great presentation. At the same time, that means that my focus is very much around their perspective. There were other people on the case than these two guys, but those are the ones I know the most about, like their perspectives of what I've heard. So James R. Fitzgerald uh, was at the time a FBI agent and then he had an interest in linguistics and later on he did a degree in linguistics as far as I know. And Natalie Schilling is a linguistics professor. A third important person on the case is Roger Shui. But before we get to those guys and what they found out and how linguistics factored into the case, let's talk about very superficially the case of the Unibomber. What's, what's that all about? The Unibomber was someone who mailed bombs in America through the post office. He was active from 1978 to 1996. The reason why he's called the Unibomber is UN for university and A for airline and of course bomb for bombs. And the reason for that name is that in the beginning he would only send bombs to universities and airlines. Later on that expanded to other things, but that's what were the origin of the name. In total he mailed 16 bombs, he killed three people and he injured more than two dozen people according to the FBI. And it seemed like random targets. He was a very very anonymous serial killer in the beginning. There were no identifiers, he would simply mail out bombs, they would explode and people weren't really able to find a connection between the victims. However, in 1995 he sent out a 35,000 word manifesto that was published in the New York Times and that was the big break and that led to the discovery that the Unibomber was Theodore Kaczynski, who's a former professor at University of California at Berkeley. So that's some very boring numbers information about the case and I, I'm not gonna go more into the case because this is not a, a true crime video where we dive into gory facts and stuff like that. But one thing I do want to talk a bit more about in detail is the manifesto because that was the big break that really um, solved the case. The fact that the FBI could analyze text so in 1995, the Unibomber mailed out the manifesto to several newspapers along with the claim that if they published the manifesto, he would stop his bombs altogether. The New York Times um, were advised by the FBI to publish it, so they did, and it's still available in their archives. I'll link that below. I haven't read it myself, but I read a superficial summary. And basically in the manifesto, the Unibomber makes the argument that from the Industrial Revolution and then onwards, we've gone through a very negative development that has destroyed nature. So he's basically making the argument that technology and all our um, individual progress is deeply harming nature and deeply harming society in other ways. Additionally, he's making the argument that we, because technology is such an ingrained part of society. We as humans are no longer just being elevated by technology, but that we are adapting to technology. So technology is really what's controlling the world. So like I said, I have not read this manifesto, so I cannot say 
anything about it really but the main argument isn't bad right i mean we can all agree that technology versus nature is a very interesting debate and that it's it's a debate that should definitely be had but his methods are absolutely insane so in addition to sort of being interesting in the sense that we understand what argument is being made or what the motivation for the spree was. It's also interesting from a forensic point of view, because in the court, the manifesto was used as an argument, both from the perspective of the prosecution and from the perspective of the defense, um, because the killer uh, did plead guilty. However, his defense team tried to use the manifesto as an argument for insanity, while the prosecution used the same document as an argument that he had a lucid mind. So it is very interesting because this manifesto meant that forensic linguistics was a central part of the judicial process. But please remember that even though I do feel that the argument about technology versus nature is very interesting and it's something that I personally am very interested in. We can both agree with an argument and also be aware that it is absolutely insane to do these things. Um, so I am in no way advocating for seeing Kaczynski as some sort of positive figure or viewing his, him as anything sort of positive. Okay, he's he's a he kills people and we that's not good. No matter how you feel about nature, that's not good. And that goes the other way too, right? We can't say, oh, this guy is insane. Thus, all his arguments are insane. Well, the, the world is more complex than that. I hope you're all aware of that. Okay, I just felt like I had to say that. Okay, anyway, let us talk about what is really interesting the forensic linguistics in the case and how linguistics was a central part of figuring out who did this and profiling the killer. Okay, so let's start off with the basic profiling. So profiling simply means sort of figuring out elements of the murderer without knowing who it is. So figuring out gender, age, etc. Before they had any real leads, they did profiling. NPR did an interview with James R. Fitzgerald and he has some examples of what really led them to what. So according to James R. Fitzgerald, a really big pointer for them was the use of archaic terms, so really old, uh, old soundy words. Um, so the killer would use terms like broad and chick to talk about women which in the 90s, according to James R. Fitzgerald, was very archaic. Another example is using the term Negro to describe African-American people, which is also a very archaic term. So this was a big pointer in regards to age. Apparently the first profiler on the case has pe had pegged the killer to be college age, which was way too young. So they made the argument that because he uses these very archaic terms, he couldn't be college age, and that turned out to be true. He was quite a bit older. Roger Shu had some similar arguments. He talks about regionalism and time. So according to him, the killer had some very eccentric spellings, which was most likely these sort of archaic terms. And the same spellings that he used could be located in the Chicago Tribune in the 40s and 50s. So now they had a very specific source of where could the killer be from. Apparently the Chicago Tribune had had an editor in the 40s and 50s who cared a lot about spelling and really wanted to preserve uh, older terms. So they had a spelling reform with some very, very specific spellings that you couldn't find anywhere else. Of course, with specific terms, we could probably find them elsewhere, but when we sort of bring together all the weird spellings and, and sort of individualisms, then they could be uh, traced back to this very specific editor of the Chicago Tribunes and his very specific spelling reform. So based on this, they knew that he grew up in Chicago and that he was about 50 years old. In addition to Chicago, they also found some regionalisms from Northern California. The killer wrote 
in the Sierras without capitalization. So apparently Sierras is normally capitalized, but he would do it without capitalization. And that's apparently very specific to Northern California. So based on this, they knew that in addition to having grown up in Chicago, he'd also spend a lot of time in Northern California, which is where he taught. So both of these were correct. So if you have a large document, you can actually figure out a lot of things. That's because people have different social lists, how they live their lives and when they live their lives and where um, really affects them. So that's why we can sort of dig into the details of documents and details of spelling and trace them to people's lives, which I think is really interesting. So that was some examples of how they could profile the killer. But how did they really figure out who did it? They had a lot of suspects and sort of figuring out a person within a certain age range who had something to do with Chicago and something to do with Northern California is sort of looking for a needle in a haystack, right? It's, it's, it's tricky. But the way Kaczynski sort of came onto their radar we, was because his brother, having heard of the case, sort of was thinking, my brother could have done this. He'd heard about the sentiments of the killer and felt that they were sort of similar to that of his brother. Additionally, his brother um, lived as a recluse in a cabin. So a lot of sort of alarm bells uh, rung in his brother's head. He contacted the FBI and he gave them a lot of text samples. He gave them letters and articles that the, his brother had written. And with that, the FBI could compare and make a stronger case for the fact that this might be the killer. They actually described that one of the articles that Kaczynski had previously written was sort of beat for beat containing the same arguments that the manifesto contained as well. So definitely there was a, an overlap in sentiments. However, many people have this sentiment, including myself, the idea that um, we should be wary of technology and that we should preserve nature is not unique. So that's not really an argument like he's the killer because he cares about nature. We can't really do that. So they had to go deeper. And he did that with linguistics. So Natalie Schilling has an article where she uh, points out some of the examples of the sort of uh, language profiling that they made. He details alternative spellings. He would write license with two C's and he'd write installment with one L. He'd also use distinctive words and phrases such as power hungry and cool headed logisticians. Additionally, they could find grammatical fillers used such as more or less, presumably, and in practice. These things in themselves, again, aren't really enough to make a case, but they're sort of building bricks that can be used as an argument. And these aren't the only cases of shared words and spellings. He just had a lot of features in common with the killer. Filling mentions a linguistic smoking gun, like the, the big thing that was quite unique to Kaczynski. Kaczynski would say the term, you can't eat your cake and have it too. This isn't wrong. Actually, this is the original wording of the term. As you know, it's it's quite normal to say you can't have your cake and eat it too. So apparently the original wording of the term is actually the other way around. So from a sort of prescriptivist view, Kaczynski was doing it the right way and everyone else is doing it the wrong way. I'm not a prescriptivist. I don't believe in that shit, but yeah, he was this presumably quite a prescriptivist and that was actually his downfalling because in using these very archaic forms, in using these special spellings, etc. He had a very specific language. He had a very unique language that could be traced to him and that became his downfalling. He was a very anonymous murderer. He was really good at staying anonymous, but the moment he let people know his language, he couldn't really get around that. And he did plead guilty. So that's all the examples I have. But before I end, I would like to repeat an argument that Natalie Schilling had. When talking about forensic linguistics, she says it's very important to be aware that 
we aren't talking about a fingerprint or DNA. Sometimes people talk about linguistic fingerprints, like something that is uniquely you. But according to Schilling, language is not acquired, but inherited. Basically, what she's saying is that we aren't born with something that is inherently us. When it comes to language, it is something that we acquire through social interaction and socially. So language can point to social aspects of our lives, but language can also be changed. It's a behavior. Even just for myself, when I write English, I sort of change between UK English and American English, just depending on what mood I'm in, really. Um, so if someone were to try and make a linguistic fingerprint for me, they would even just be stunted by, does this person write UK English or US English? So we, we can change language. And if I do make more videos, I would love to talk more about cases where language has been it deliberately changed to point elsewhere. We'll get more into that in another video. But it is just very important to, uh, to be aware of when we talk about forensic linguistics, that it is still more like profiling and more like psychological profiling, right? That it is sort of, we can make an argument, but we need a lot of accumulative evidence. So I hope you learned something about how language can be used in forensics. I personally think it's, it's very interesting. Also, just because I care deeply about linguistics, a big part of my degree was linguistics. So knowing that, you know, linguistics can solve murders. How could we have made a case against Kaczynski without linguistics? How could we have made a strong case? There were other factors, of course, it wasn't purely linguistic evidence, but the linguistic part of it really strengthened the argument that he was the killer. And yeah, I, I hope you found it interesting. I definitely think it's a super interesting case. And I will definitely, no matter if you guys want it or not, I will definitely be making more videos on forensic linguistics because it's something I think is interesting. And I mean, I, I don't, <laughs> this is a hobby, okay? I'll just make the videos I wanna make. But I do hope that some people find it interesting. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in another video and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye.